Section 58 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. Secret History of Charles I and His First Parliaments, Part 2. These are instances drawn from the inferior classes of society, but the same spirit actuated the country gentlemen. One instance represents many. George Gatesby, of Northamptonshire, being committed to prison as a lone recusant, alleged, among other reasons for his non-compliance, that he considered that this loan might become a precedent, and that every precedent he was told by the Lord President was a flower of the prerogative. The Lord President told him that he lied. Gatesby shook his head, observing, I come not here to contend with your lordship, but to suffer. Lord Suffolk then interposing, entreated the Lord President would not too far urge his kinsman, Mr. Gatesby. This country gentleman waived any kindness he might owe to kindred, declaring that he would remain master of his own purse. The prisons were crowded with these lone recusants, as well as with those who had sinned in the freedom of their opinions. The country gentlemen ensured their popularity by their committals, and many stout resistors of the loans were returned in the following Parliament against their own wishes. Footnote. It is curious to observe that the Westminster elections, in the fourth year of Charles's reign, were exactly of the same turbulent character as those which we witness in our days. The Duke had counted by his interest to bring in Sir Robert Pye. The contest was severe, but accompanied by some of those ludicrous electioneering scenes which still amuse the mob. Whenever Sir Robert Pye's party cried, A pie, a pie, a pie! The adverse party would cry, A pudding, a pudding, a pudding! And others, A lie, a lie, a lie! This Westminster election of two hundred years ago ended as we have seen some others. They rejected all who had urged the payment of loans, and, passing by such men as Sir Robert Cotton and their last representative, they fixed on a brewer and a grocer for the two members for Westminster. End of footnote. The friends of these knights and country gentlemen flocked to their prisons, and when they petitioned for more liberty and air during the summer, it was policy to grant their request but it was also policy that they should not reside in their own counties. This relaxation was only granted to those who, living in the south, consented to sojourn in the north, while the dwellers in the north were to be lodged in the south. In the country, the disturbed scenes assumed even a more alarming appearance than in London. They not only would not provide money, but when money was offered by government, the men refused to serve, a conscription was not then known, and it became a question long debated in the Privy Council whether those who would not accept press money should not be tried by martial law. I preserve in the note a curious piece of secret information. Footnote Extract from a manuscript letter On Friday last I hear, but as a secret, that it was debated at the council table whether our Essex men, who refused to take press money, should not be punished by martial law, and hanged up on the next tree to their dwellings, for an example of terror to others. My Lord Keeper, who had been long silent when, in conclusion, it came to his course to speak, told the lords that, as far as he understood the law, none were liable to martial law but martial men. If these had taken press money, and afterwards run from their colours, they might be punished in that manner. But yet— they were no soldiers, and refused to be. Secondly, he thought a subsidy, new by law, could not be pressed against his will for a foreign service. It being supposed, in law, the service of his purse excused that of his person, unless his own country were in danger, and he appealed to my lord treasurer and my lord president whether it was not so, who both assented it was so, though some of them faintly, as unwilling to have been urged to such an answer. So it is thought that proposition is dashed, 
and it will be tried what may be done in the star chamber against these refractories. End of footnote. The great novelty and symptom of the times was the scattering of letters. Sealed letters addressed to the leading men of the country were found hanging on bushes, anonymous letters were dropped in shops and streets, which gave notice that the day was fast approaching when such a work was to be wrought in England as never was the like, which will be for our good. Addresses multiplied. To all true-hearted Englishmen. A groom detected in spreading such seditious papers, and brought into the inexorable star chamber, was fined three thousand pounds. The leniency of the punishment was rather regretted by two bishops. If it was ever carried into execution, the unhappy man must have remained a groom who never after crossed a horse. There is one difficult duty of an historian, which is too often passed over by the party writer. It is to pause whenever he feels himself warming with the passions of the multitude, or becoming the blind apologist of arbitrary power. An historian must transform himself into the characters which he is representing, and throw himself back into the times which he is opening, possessing himself of their feelings and tracing their actions. He may then at least hope to discover truths which may equally interest the honorable men of all parties. This reflection has occurred from the very difficulty into which I am now brought. Shall we at once condemn the king for these arbitrary measures? It is, however, very possible that they were never in his contemplation. Involved in inexorable difficulties, according to his feelings, he was betrayed by Parliament, and he scorned to barter their favor by that vulgar traffic of treachery, the immolation of the single victim who had long attached his personal affections, a man at least as much envied as hated. That hard lesson had not yet been inculcated on a British sovereign, that his bosom must be a blank for all private affection, and had that lesson been taught, the character of Charles was destitute of all aptitude for it. To reign without a refractory parliament, and to find among the people themselves subjects more loyal than their representatives, was an experiment, and a fatal one. Under Charles the liberty of the subject, when the necessities of the state pressed on the sovereign, was matter of discussion, disputed as often as assumed. The divines were proclaiming as rebellious those who refused their contributions to aid the government, and the law sages alleged precedents for raising supplies in the manner which Charles had adopted. Footnote. A member of the House, in James I's time, called this race of divines spaniels to the court and wolves to the people. Dr. Mainwaring, Dr. Sibthorpe, and Dean Bargrave were seeking for ancient precedents to maintain absolute monarchy, and to inculcate passive obedience. Bargrave had this passage in his sermon. It was the speech of a man renowned for wisdom in our age, that if he were commanded to put forth to sea in a ship that had neither mast nor tackling, he would do it. And being asked what wisdom that were, replied, The wisdom must be in him that hath power to command, not in him that conscience binds to obey. Sibthorpe, after he published his sermon, immediately had his house burnt down. Dr. Mainwaring says a manuscript letter-writer sent the other day to a friend of mine to help him to all the ancient precedents he could find to strengthen his opinion for absolute monarchy, who answered him he could help him in nothing but only to hang him, and that if he lived till a parliament, or etc., he should be sure of a halter. Mainwaring afterwards submitted to Parliament, but after the dissolution got a free pardon. The panic of popery was a great evil. The divines, under Laud, appeared to approach to Catholicism, but it was probably only a project of reconciliation between the two churches, which Elizabeth, James, and Charles equally wished. Mr. Cousins, a letter-writer, is censured for superstition in this bitter style. Mr. Cousins has impudently made three editions of his prayer-book, and one which gives him away in private, different from the published ones. An audacious fellow, whom my lord of Durham greatly admireth. I doubt if he be a sound Protestant. He was so blind at evensong on Candlemas Day, 
that he could not see to read prayers in the minster with less than three hundred and forty candles, whereof sixty he caused to be placed about the high altar. Besides, he caused the picture of our Saviour, supported by two angels, to be set in the choir. The committee is very hot against him, no matter if they trounce him. This was Cousins, who survived the revolution, and returning with Charles the Second, was raised to the see of Durham. The charitable institutions he has left are most munificent. End of footnote. Selden, whose learned industry was as vast as the amplitude of his mind, had to seek for the freedom of the subject in the dust of the records of the tower, and the omnipotence of parliaments, if any human assembly may be invested with such supernatural greatness, had not yet awakened the hoar antiquity of popular liberty. A general spirit of insurrection, rather than insurrection itself, had suddenly raised some strange appearances through the kingdom. The remonstrance of Parliament had unquestionably quickened the feelings of the people, but yet the lovers of peace and the reverencers of royalty were not a few. Money and men were procured to send out the army and the fleet. More concealed causes may be suspected to have been at work. Many of the heads of the opposition were pursuing some secret machinations. About this time I find many mysterious stories, indications of secret societies, and other evidences of the intrigues of the popular party. Little matters, sometimes more important than they appear, are suitable to our minute sort of history. In November 1626, a rumor spread that the king was to be visited by an ambassador from the president of the Society of the Rosy Cross. He was indeed a heteroclite ambassador, for he is described as a youth with never a hair on his face, in fact, a child who was to conceal the mysterious personage which he was for a moment to represent. He appointed Sunday afternoon to come to court, attended by thirteen coaches. He was to proffer to his majesty, provided the king accepted his advice, three millions to put in his coffers, and by his secret counsels he was to unfold matters of moment and secrecy. A Latin letter was delivered to David Ramsay of the Clock, to hand over to the king. A copy of it has been preserved in a letter of the times, but it is so unmeaning that it could have had no effect on the king, who, however, declared that he would not admit him to an audience, and that if he could tell where the president of the Rosy Cross was to be found, unless he made good his offer, he would hang him at the court gates. This served the town and country for talk till the appointed Sunday had passed over, and no ambassador was visible. Some considered this as the plotting of crazy brains, but others imagined it to be an attempt to speak with the king in private on matters respecting the duke. There was also discovered, by letters received from Rome, a whole parliament of Jesuits sitting in a fair-hanged vault in Clerkenwell. Sir John Cook would have alarmed the parliament that on St. Joseph's Day these were to have occupied their places. Ministers are supposed to sometimes have conspirators for the nonce. Sir Dudley Diggs, in the opposition as usual, would not believe in any such political necromancers, but such a party were discovered, Cook would have insinuated that the French ambassador had persuaded Louis that the divisions between Charles and his people had been raised by his ingenuity, and was reward for the intelligence. This is not unlikely. After all, the Parliament of Jesuits might have been a secret college of the order, for, among other things seized on, was a considerable library. When the Parliament was sitting, a sealed letter was thrown under the door, with this superscription, Cursed be the man that finds this letter, and delivers it not to the House of Commons. The sergeant-at-arms delivered it to the speaker, who would not open it till the House had chosen a committee of twelve members to inform them whether it was fit to be read. Sir Edward Coke, after having read two or three lines, stopped, and according to my authority, durst read no further, but immediately sealing it, the committee thought fit to send it to the king, who they say, on reading it through, cast it into the fire, and sent the House of Commons thanks for their wisdom in not publishing it, and for the discretion of the committee in so far tendering his honour as not to read it out when they once perceived that it touched his majesty. Footnote. 
I deliver this fact as I find it in a private letter, but it is noticed in the journals of the House of Commons, 23rd June, No. 4, Caroly Regis. Sir Edward Coke reporteth that they find that, enclosed in the letter, to be unfit for any subject's ear to hear, read but one line and a half of it, and could not endure to read more of it. It was ordered to be sealed and delivered into the king's hands by eight members, and to acquaint his majesty with the place and time of finding it, particularly that upon reading of one line and a half at most, they would read no more, but sealed it up and brought it to the house. End a footnote. Others, besides the freedom of speech, introduced another form, a speech without doors, which was distributed to the members of the house. It is, in all respects, a remarkable one, occupying ten folio pages in the first volume of Rushworth. Some in office appear to have employed extraordinary proceedings of a similar nature. An intercepted letter written from the Archduchess to the King of Spain was delivered by Sir H. Martin at the Council Board on New Year's Day, who found it in some papers relating to the Navy. The Duke immediately said he would show it to the King, and, accompanied by several lords, went into His Majesty's closet. The letter was written in French. It advised the Spanish court to make a sudden war with England, for several reasons. His Majesty's want of skill to govern himself, the weakness of his counsel in not daring to acquaint him with the truth, want of money, disunion of the subjects' hearts from their prince, etc. The king only observed that the writer forgot that the Archduchess writes to the King of Spain in Spanish and sends her letters overland. I have to add an important fact. I find certain evidence that the heads of the opposition were busily active in thwarting the measures of government. Dr. Samuel Turner, the member for Shrewsbury, called on Sir John Cage, and desired to speak to him privately. His errand was to entreat him to resist the loan, and to use his power with others to obtain this purpose. The following information comes from Sir John Cage himself. Dr. Turner, being desired to stay, he would not a minute, but instantly took horse, saying he had more places to go, and time pressed. That there was a company of them had divided themselves into all parts, every one having a quarter assigned to him, to perform this service for the Commonwealth. This was written in November 1626. This unquestionably amounts to a secret confederacy watching out of Parliament as well as in, and those strange appearances of popular defection exhibited in the country which I have described were in great part the consequences of the machinations and active intrigues of the popular party. Footnote. I have since discovered by a manuscript letter that this Dr. Turner was held in contempt by the king, that he was ridiculed at court, which he haunted for his want of veracity in a word, that he was a disappointed courtier. End of footnote. The king was not disposed to try a third parliament. The favorite, perhaps to regain that popular favor which his greatness had lost him, is said in private letters to have been twice on his knees to intercede for a new one. The elections, however, foreboded no good, and a letter-writer connected with the court in giving an account of them prophetically declared, We are without question undone. The king's speech opens with the spirit which he himself felt, but which he could not communicate. The times are for action, wherefore, for example's sake, I mean not to spend much time in words. If you, which God forbid, should not do your duties in contributing what the state at this time needs, I must, in discharge of my conscience, use those other means which God hath put into my hands, to save that which the follies of some particular men may otherwise hazard to lose. He added with the loftiness of ideal majesty, Take not this as a threatening, for I scorn to threaten any but my equals, but as an admonition from him that, both out of nature and duty, hath most care of your preservations and prosperities. And in a more friendly tone he requested them to remember a thing to the end that we may forget it. You may imagine that I come here with a doubt of success, remembering the distractions of the last meeting, but I assure you that I shall very easily forget and forgive what is past. 
a most crowded house now met, composed of the wealthiest men, for a lord, who probably considered that property was a true balance of power, estimated that they were able to buy the upper house his majesty only accepted. The aristocracy of wealth had already begun to be felt. Some ill omens of the Parliament appeared. Sir Robert Phillips moved for a general fast. We had one for the plague, which it pleased God to deliver us from, and we have now so many plagues of the commonwealth about his majesty's person that we have need of such, an act of humiliation. Sir Edward Coke held it most necessary, because there are, I fear, some devils that will not be cast out but by fasting and prayer. Many of the speeches in this great council of the kingdom are as admirable pieces of composition as exist in the language. Even the court party were moderate, extenuating rather than pleading for the late necessities. But the evil spirit of party, however veiled, was walking amidst them all. A letter writer represents the natural state of feelings. Some of the Parliament talked desperately, while others, of as high a course to enforce money if they yield not. Such is the perpetual action and reaction of public opinion, when one side will give too little, the other is sure to desire too much. The Parliament granted subsidies. Sir John Cook having brought up the report to the King, Charles expressed great satisfaction, and declared that he felt, now, more happy than any of his predecessors. Inquiring of Sir John by how many voices he had carried it, Cook replied, but by one, at which His Majesty seemed appalled and asked how many were against him. Cook answered, none, the unanimity of the house made all but one voice, at which His Majesty wept. If Charles shed tears, or as Cook himself expresses it in his report to the house, was much affected, the emotion was profound, for on all sudden emergencies Charles displayed an almost unparalleled command over the exterior violence of his feelings. The favorite himself sympathized with the tender joy of his royal master, and before the king voluntarily offered himself as a peace sacrifice. In his speech at the council table, he entreats the king that he, who had the honor to be his majesty's favorite, might now give up that title to them. A warm, genuine feeling probably prompted these words. To open my heart, please pardon me a word more. I must confess I have long lived in pain. Sleep hath given me no rest, favors and fortune no content. Such have been my secret sorrows to be thought the man of separation, and that divided the king from his people, and them from him. But I hope it shall appear they were some mistaken minds that would have made me the evil spirit that walketh between a good master and a loyal people. Buckingham added that for the good of his country he was willing to sacrifice his honors, and since his plurality of offices had been so strongly accepted against, that he was content to give up the master of the horse to Marcus Hamilton, and the warden of the sink ports to the Earl of Carlisle, and was willing that the Parliament should appoint another admiral for all services at sea. It is as certain as human evidence can authenticate that on the king's side all was grateful affection, and that on Buckingham's there was a most earnest desire to win the favors of Parliament, and what are stronger than all human evidence, those unerring principles in human nature itself, which are the secret springs of the heart, were working in the breasts of the king and his minister, for neither were tyrannical. The king undoubtedly sighed to meet Parliament with the love which he had at first professed. He declared that he should now rejoice to meet with his people often. Charles had no innate tyranny in his constitutional character, and Buckingham at times was susceptible of misery amidst his greatness, as I have elsewhere shown. It could not have been imagined that the luckless favorite, on the present occasion, should have served as a pretext to set again in motion the chaos of evil. Can any candid mind suppose that the king or the duke meditated the slightest insult on the patriotic party, or would in the least have disturbed the apparent reconciliation? Yet it so happened. Secretary Cook, at the close of his report of the king's acceptance of the subsidies, 
mentioned that the duke had fervently beseeched the king to grant the house all their desires perhaps the mention of the duke's name was designed to ingratiate him into their toleration sir john elliot caught fire at the very name of the duke and vehemently checked the secretary for having dared to introduce it declaring that they knew of no other distinction but of king and subjects by intermingling a subject's speech with the king's message he seemed to derogate from the honour and majesty of a king nor would it become any subject to bear himself in such fashion as if no grace ought to descend from the king to the people nor any loyalty ascend from the people to the king but through him only this speech was received by many with acclamations some cried out well spoken sir john elliot it marks the heated state of the political atmosphere where even the lightest coruscation of a hated name made it burst into flames i have often suspected that sir john elliot by his vehement personality must have borne a personal antipathy to buckingham i have never been enabled to ascertain the fact but i find that he has left in manuscript a collection of satires or verses being chiefly invectives against the duke of buckingham to whom he bore a bitter and most inveterate enmity could we sometimes discover the motives of those who first had political revolutions we should find how greatly personal hatreds have actuated them in deeds which have come down to us in the form of patriotism and how often the revolutionary spirit disguises its private passions by its public conduct footnote modern history would afford more instances than perhaps some of us suspect i cannot pass over an illustration of my principle which i shall take from two very notorious politicians watt tyler and sir william walworth modern history would afford more instances than perhaps some of us suspect i cannot pass over an illustration of my principle which i shall take from two very notorious politicians watt tyler and sir william walworth watt when in servitude had been beaten by his master richard lyons a great merchant of wines and a sheriff of london this chastisement working on an evil disposition appears never to have been forgiven and when this radical assumed his short-lived dominion he had his old master beheaded and his head carried before him on the point of a spear so grafton tells us to the eternal obloquy of this arch jacobin who was a crafty fellow and of an excellent wit but wanting grace i would not sully the patriotic blow which ended the rebellion with the rebel yet there are secrets in history sir william walsworth the ever famous mayor of london as stowe designates him has left the immortality of his name to one of our suburbs but having discovered in stowe's survey that walworth was the landlord of the stews on the bankside which he farmed out to the dutch vrouws and which watt had pulled down I am inclined to suspect that private feeling first knocked down the saucy ribald, and then thrust him through and through with his dagger, and that there was as much of personal vengeance as patriotism which crushed the demolisher of so much valuable property. End of footnote. But the supplies which had raised tears from the fervent gratitude of Charles, though voted, were yet withheld. They resolved that grievances and supplies go hand in hand. The commons entered deeply into constitutional points of the highest magnitude. The curious erudition of Selden and Coke was combined with the ardor of patriots who merit no inferior celebrity, though not having consecrated their names by their laborious literature, we only discover them in the obscure annals of Parliament. To our history, composed by writers of different principles, I refer the reader for the argument of lawyers, and the spirit of the commons. My secret history is only its supplement. The king's prerogative and the subject's liberty were points hard to distinguish, and were established but by contest. Sometimes the king imagined that the house pressed not upon the abuses of power, but only upon power itself. Sometimes the commons doubted whether they had anything of their own to give, while their property and their persons seemed equally insecure despotism seemed to stand on one side and faction on the other liberty trembled the conference of the commons before the lords on the freedom and person of the subject was admirably conducted by selden and by coke 
when the king's attorney affected to slight the learned arguments and precedents pretending to consider them as mutilated out of the records and as proving rather against the commons than for them sir edward coke rose affirming to the house upon his skill in the law that it lay not under mr attorney's cap to answer any one of their arguments selden declared that he had written out all the records from the tower the exchequer and the king's bench with his own hand and would engage his head mr attorney should not find in all these archives a single precedent omitted mr littleton said that he had examined every one syllabatum and whoever said they were mutilated spoke false of so ambiguous and delicate a nature was then the liberty of the subject that it seems they considered it to depend on precedence a startling message on the twelfth of april was sent by the king for dispatch of business the house struck with astonishment desired to have it repeated they remained sad and silent no one cared to open the debate a whimsical politician sir francis nethersole suddenly started up entreating leave to tell his last night's dream footnote i have formed my idea of sir francis nethersole from some strange incidents in his political conduct which i have read in some contemporary letters he was however a man of some eminence had been a raider for the university of cambridge agent for james i with the princes of the union in germany and also secretary to the queen of bohemia he founded and endowed a free school at polesworth in warwickshire End of footnote. some laughing at him he observed that kingdoms had been saved by dreams allowed to proceed he said he saw two good pastures a flock of sheep was in the one and a bellwether alone in the other a great ditch was between them and a narrow bridge over the ditch he was interrupted by the speaker who told him that it stood not with the gravity of the house to listen to dreams but the house was inclined to hear him out the sheep would sometimes go over to the bellwether or the bellwether to the sheep once both met on the narrow bridge and the question was who should go back since both could not go on without danger one sheep gave counsel that the sheep on the bridge should lie on their bellies and let the bellwether go over their backs the application of this dilemma he left to the house it must be confessed that the bearing of the point was more ambiguous than some of the important ones that formed the matters of their debates davis sum non sedipus it is probable that this fantastical politician did not vote with the opposition for elliot wentworth and coke protested against the interpretation of dreams in the house when the attorney-general moved that the liberties of the subject might be moderated to reconcile the differences between themselves and the sovereign sir edward coke observed that the true mother would never consent to the dividing of her child on this buckingham swore that coke intimated that the king his master was the prostitute of the state coke protested against the misinterpretation the dream of nethersole and the metaphor of coke were alike dangerous in parliamentary discussion End of section 58. Recording by Corinne LePage. Section 59 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. Secret History of Charles I and His First Parliaments, Part 3. In a manuscript letter, it is said that the House of Commons sat four days without speaking or doing anything. On the 1st of May, Secretary Cook delivered a message asking whether they would rely upon the King's word. This question was followed by a long silence several speeches are reported in the letters of the times which are not in rushworth sir nathaniel rich observed that confident that he was of the royal word what did any indefinite word ascertain pym said we have his majesty's coronation oath to maintain the laws of england what need we then take his word he proposed to move whether he should take the king's word or no this was resisted by secretary cook 
what would they say in foreign parts if the people of england would not trust their king he desired the house to call pym to order on which pym replied truly mr speaker i am just of the same opinion as i was vis a vis that the king's oath was as powerful as his word sir john eliot moved that it be put to the question because they that would have it do urge us to that point sir edward coke on this occasion made a memorable speech of which the following passage is not given in rushworth we sit now in parliament and therefore must take his majesty's word no otherwise than in a parliamentary way that is of a matter agreed on by both houses his majesty sitting on his throne in his robes with his crown on his head, and sceptre in his hand, and in full parliament, and his royal assent being entered upon record, in perpetuam re memoriam. This was the royal word of a king in parliament, and not a word delivered in a chamber, and out of the mouth of a secretary at the second hand. Therefore I motion that the House of Commons, more majorum, should draw up a petition, de draict, to his majesty, which being confirmed by both houses and assented unto by his majesty will be as firm an act as any not that i distrust the king but that i cannot take his trust but in a parliamentary way footnote these speeches are entirely drawn from those manuscript letters to which i have frequently referred coke's may be substantially found in rushworth but without a single expression as here given end of footnote in this speech of sir edward coke we find the first mention in the legal style of the ever memorable petition of right which two days after was finished the reader must pursue its history among the writers of opposite parties on tuesday june fifth a royal message announced that on the eleventh the present sessions would close this utterly disconcerted the commons religious men considered it as a judicial visitation for the sins of the people others raged with suppressed feelings they counted up all the disasters which had of late occurred all which were charged to one man they knew not at a moment so urgent when all their liberty seemed at stake whether the commons should fly to the lords or to the king sir john eliot said that as they intended to furnish his majesty with money it was proper that he should give them time to supply him with counsel he was renewing his old attacks on the duke when he was suddenly interrupted by the speaker, who, starting from the chair, declared that he was commanded not to suffer him to proceed. Elliot sat down in sullen silence. On Wednesday, Sir Edward Coke broke the ice of the debate. "'That man,' he said of the Duke, "'is the grievance of grievances. As for going to the Lords,' he added, "'that is not via regia. Our liberties are impeached. It is our concern.' on thursday the vehement cry of coke against buckingham was followed up as says a letter-writer when one good hound recovers the scent the rest come in with a full cry footnote the popular opinion is well expressed in the following lines preserved in sloan m s eight hundred and twenty six when only one doth rule and guide the ship who neither card nor compass knew before the master pilot and the rest asleep the stately ship is split upon the shore. But they awaken, start up, stare, and cry, Who did this fault? Not I, nor I, nor I. So fares it with a great and wealthy state, not governed by the master, but his mate. End of footnote. A sudden message from the king absolutely forbade them to asperse any of his majesty's ministers, otherwise his majesty would instantly dissolve them this felt like a thunderbolt it struck terror and alarm and at the instant the house of commons was changed into a scene of tragical melancholy all the opposite passions of human nature all the national evils which were one day to burst on the country seemed on a sudden concentrated in this single spot some were seen weeping some were expostulating and some in awful prophecy were contemplating the future ruin of the kingdom while others of more ardent daring were reproaching the timid quieting the terrified and infusing resolution into the despairing many attempted to speak but were so strongly affected that their very utterance failed them the venerable coke overcome by his feelings when he rose to speak 
found his learned eloquence falter on his tongue. He sat down, and tears were seen on his aged cheeks. The name of the public enemy of the kingdom was repeated, till the speaker, with tears covering his face, declared he could no longer witness such a spectacle of woe in the commons of England, and requested leave of absence for half an hour. The speaker hastened to the king to inform him of the state of the house. They were preparing a vote against the duke, for being an arch-traitor and an arch-enemy to king and kingdom, and were busied on their remonstrance when the speaker, on his return, after an absence of two hours, delivered his majesty's message that they should adjourn till the next day. This was an awful interval of time. Many trembled for the issue of the next morning. One letter writer calls it, that black and doleful Thursday, and another, writing before the house met, observes, what we shall expect this morning, God of heaven knows we shall meet timely. Charles probably had been greatly affected by the report of the speaker on the extraordinary state into which the whole house had been thrown, for on Friday the royal message imported that the king had never any intention of barring them from their right, but only to avoid scandal, that his ministers should not be accused for their counsel to him, and still he hoped that all Christendom might notice a sweet parting between him and his people. This message quieted the house, but did not suspend their preparations for a remonstrance, which they had begun on the day they were threatened with a dissolution. On Saturday, while they were still occupied on the remonstrance, unexpectedly, at four o'clock, the king came to Parliament, and the commons were called up. Charles spontaneously came to reconcile himself to Parliament. The king now gave his second answer to the petition of right. He said, My maxim is that the people's liberties strengthen the king's prerogative, and the king's prerogative is to defend the people's liberties. Read your petition, and you shall have an answer that I am sure will please you. They desired to have the ancient form of their ancestors, soit droit fait comme il est désiré, and not as the king had before given it, with any observation on it. Charles now granted this, declaring that his second answer to the petition in no wise differed from his first. But you now see how ready I have shown myself to satisfy your demands. I have done my part, Wherefore, if this Parliament have not a happy conclusion, the sin is yours. I am free from it. Popular gratitude is at least as vociferous as it is sudden. Both houses returned the king's acclamations of joy. Everyone seemed to exult at the happy change which a few days had effected in the fate of the kingdom. Everywhere the bells rung, bonfires were kindled, an universal holiday was kept through the town and spread to the country but an ominous circumstance has been registered by a letter-writer. The common people, who had caught the contagious happiness, imagined that all this public joy was occasioned by the king's consenting to commit the duke to the tower. Charles had been censured, even by Hume, for his evasions and delays in granting his assent to the petition of right. But now either the Parliament had conquered the royal unwillingness, or the king was zealously inclined on reconciliation— Yet the joy of the commons did not outlast the bonfires on the streets. They resumed their debates as if they had never before touched on the subjects. They did not account for the feelings of the man whom they addressed as the sovereign. They set up a remonstrance against the duke, and introduced his mother into it as a patroness of popery. Charles declared that after having granted the famous petition, he had not expected such a return as this remonstrance. How acceptable it is, he afterwards said, every man may judge, no wise man can justify it. After the reading of the remonstrance, the duke fell on his knees, desiring to answer for himself, but Charles no way relaxed in showing his personal favor. The duke was often charged with actions and expressions of which, unquestionably, he was not always guilty, and we can more fairly decide on some points relating to Charles and the favorite, for we have a clearer notion of them than his contemporaries. The active spirits in the commons were resolved to hunt down the game to the death, for they now struck out, as the king calls it, one of the chief maintenances of my crown, in tonnage and poundage, the levying of which, they now declared, was a violation of the liberties of the people. This subject again involved legal discussions and another remonstrance. 
they were in the act of reading it when the king suddenly came down to the house sent for the speaker and prorogued the parliament i am forced to end this session said charles some few hours before i meant being not willing to receive any more remonstrances to which i must give a harsh answer there was at least as much of sorrow as of anger in this closing speech buckingham once more was to offer his life for the honour of his master and to court popularity it is well known with what exterior fortitude charles received the news of the duke's assassination this imperturbable majesty of his mind insensibility it was not never deserted him on many similar occasions there was no indecision no feebleness in his conduct and that extraordinary event was not suffered to delay the expedition the king's personal industry astonished all the men in office one writes that the king had done more in six weeks than in the duke's time had done in six months the death of buckingham caused no change the king left every man to his own charge but took the general direction into his own hands in private charles deeply mourned the loss of buckingham he gave no encouragement to his enemies the king called him his martyr and declared the world was greatly mistaken in him for it was thought that the favourite had ruled his majesty but it was far otherwise for that the duke had been to him a faithful and obedient servant such were the feelings and ideas of the unfortunate charles i which it is necessary to become acquainted with to judge of few have possessed the leisure or the disposition to perform this historical duty involved as it is in the history of our passions if ever the man shall be viewed as well as the monarch the private history of charles i will form one of the most pathetic of biographies footnote i have given volume two page three hundred and thirty six the secret history of charles i and his queen where i have traced the firmness and independence of his character in another article will be found as much of the secret history of the duke of buckingham as i have been enabled to acquire End of footnote. all the foreign expeditions of charles i were alike disastrous the vast genius of richelieu at its meriden had paled our ineffectual star the dreadful surrender of rochelle had sent back our army and navy baffled and disgraced and buckingham had timely perished to save one more reproach one more political crime attached to his name such failures did not improve the temper of the times but the most brilliant victory would not have changed the fate of charles nor allied the fiery spirits in the commons who as charles said not satisfied in hearing complainers had erected themselves into inquisitors after complaints parliament met the king's speech was conciliatory he acknowledged that the exaction of the duties of the customs was not a right which he derived from his hereditary prerogative but one which he enjoyed as the gift of his people these duties as yet had not indeed been formally confirmed by parliament but they had never been refused to the sovereign the king closed with a fervent ejaculation that the session begun with confidence might end with a mutual good understanding footnote to conclude said the king let us not be jealous one of the other's actions and a footnote the shade of buckingham was no longer cast between charles i and the commons and yet we find that their dread and dear sovereign was not allowed any repose on the throne the new demon of national discord religion in a metaphysical garb reared its distracted head this evil spirit had been raised by the conduct of the court divines whose political sermons with their attempts to return to the more solemn ceremonies of the romish church alarmed some tender consciences it served as a masked battery for the patriotic party to change their ground at will without slackening their fire when the king urged for the duties of his customs he found that he was addressing a committee sitting for religion sir john eliot threw out a singular expression alluding to some of the bishops whom he called masters of ceremonies he confessed that some ceremonies were commendable such as that we should stand up at the repetition of the creed to testify the resolution of our hearts to defend the religion we profess 
and in some churches they did not only stand upright, but with their swords drawn. His speech was a spark that fell into a well-laid train. Scarcely can we conceive the enthusiastic temper of the House of Commons at that moment, when, after some debate, they entered a vow to preserve the Articles of Religion established by Parliament in the thirteenth year of our late Queen Elizabeth. And this vow was immediately followed up by a petition to the king for a fast for the increasing miseries of the reformed churches abroad. Parliaments are liable to have their passions. Some of these enthusiasts were struck by a panic, not perhaps warranted by the danger of Jesuits and Armenians. The king answered them in good humor, observing, however, on the state of the reformed abroad, that fighting would do them more good than fasting— he granted them their fast, but they would now grant no return. For now they presented a declaration to the king that tonnage and poundage must give precedency to religion. The king's answer still betrays no ill temper. He confessed that he did not think that religion was in so much danger as they affirmed. He reminds them of tonnage and poundage. I do not so much desire it out of greediness of the thing, as out of desire to put an end to those questions that arise between me and some of my subjects. Never had the king been more moderate in his claims, or more tender in his style, and never had the commons been more fierce and never in truth so utterly inexorable. Often kings are tyrannical, and sometimes are parliaments. A body corporate, with the infection of passion, may perform acts of injustice equally with the individual who abuses the power with which he is invested. It was insisted that Charles should give up the receivers of the customs, who were denounced as capital enemies to the king and kingdom, while those who submitted to the duties were declared guilty as accessories. When Sir John Eliot was pouring forth invectives against some courtiers, however they may have merited the blast of his eloquence, he was sometimes interrupted and sometimes cheered for the stinging personalities. The timid speaker, refusing to put the question, suffered a severe reprimand from Selden. If you will not put it, we must sit still, and thus we shall never be able to do anything. The house adjourned in great heat. The dark prognostic of the next meeting— which Sir Simmons Dews has remarked in his diary as the most gloomy, sad, and dismal day for England that happened for five hundred years. On this fatal day, the speaker still refusing to put the question and announcing the king's command for adjournment, Sir John Eliot stood up. Footnote. Monday, 2nd of March, 1629. End a footnote. The speaker attempted to leave the chair, but two members who had placed themselves on each side forcibly kept him down. Elliot, who had prepared a short declaration, flung down a paper on the floor, crying out that it might be read. His party vociferated for the reading, others that it should not. A sudden tumult broke out. Coriton, a fervent patriot, struck another member, and many laid their hands on their swords. Footnote it was imagined out of doors that swords had been drawn, for a Welsh page running in great haste, when he heard the noise to the door cried out, I pray you let her in, let her in, to give her master his sword. Manuscript letter. End of footnote. Shall we, said one, be sent home as we were last sessions, turned off like scattered sheep? The weeping, trembling speaker, still persisting in what he held to be his duty, was dragged to and fro by opposite parties, but neither he nor the clerk would read the paper, though the speaker was bitterly reproached by his kinsman, Sir Peter Heyman, as the disgrace of his country and a blot to a noble family. Elliot, finding the house so strongly divided, undauntedly snatching up the paper, said, I shall then express that by my tongue which this paper should have done. Denzel Halls assumed the character of speaker, putting the question, it was returned by the acclamations of the party. The doors were locked, and the keys laid on the table. The king sent for the sergeant and mace, but the messenger could obtain no admittance. The usher of the black rod met no more regard. The king then ordered out his guard. In the meanwhile, the protest was completed. 
the door was flung open the rush of the members was so impetuous that the crowd carried away among them the sergeant and the usher in the confusion and riot many of the members were struck by horror amidst this conflict it was a sad image of the future several of the patriots were committed to the tower the king on dissolving this parliament which was the last till the memorable long parliament gives us at least his idea of it it is far from me to judge all the house alike guilty for there are there as dutiful subjects as any in the world it being but some few vipers among them that did cast this mist of undutifulness over most of their eyes footnote at the time many undoubtedly considered that it was a mere faction of the house sir simmons dues was certainly no politician but unquestionably his ideas were not peculiar to himself of the last third parliament he delivers this opinion in his diary i cannot deem but the greater part of the house were morally honest men but these were the least guilty of the fatal breach being only misled by some other machiavellian politics who seemed zealous for the liberty of the commonwealth and by that means in the moving of their outward freedom drew the votes of those good men to their side End of footnote. thus i have traced step by step the secret history of charles i and his early parliaments i have entered into their feelings while i have supplied new facts to make everything as present and as true as my faithful diligence could repeat the tale it was necessary that i should sometimes judge of the first race of our patriots as some of their contemporaries did but it was impossible to avoid correcting these notions by the more enlarged views of their posterity this is the privilege of an historian and the philosophy of his art there is no apology for the king nor any declamation for the subject were we only to decide by the final results of this great conflict of which what we have here narrated is but the faint beginning we should confess that sir john eliot and his party were the first fathers of our political existence and we should not withhold from them the inexpressible gratitude of a nation's freedom but human infirmity mortifies us in the noblest pursuits of man and we must be taught this penitential and chastising wisdom the story of our patriots is involved charles appears to have been lowering those high notions of his prerogative which were not peculiar to him and was throwing himself on the bosom of his people the severe and unrelenting conduct of sir john eliot his prompt eloquence and bold invective well fitted him for the leader of a party he was the lodestone drawing together the loose particles of iron never sparing in the monarch the errors of man never relinquishing his royal prey which he had fastened on eliot with dr turner and some others contributed to make charles disgusted with all parliaments without any dangerous concessions there was more than one moment when they might have reconciled the sovereign to themselves and not have driven him to the fatal resource of attempting to reign without a parliament footnote since the publication of the present article i have composed my commentaries on the life and reign of charles i in five volumes end of footnote end of section fifty nine Recording by Corinne LePage Section 60 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 by Isaac Disraeli. The Rump text and commentary the french revolution abounds with wonderful explanatory notes on the english it has cleared up many obscure passages and in the political history of man both pages must be read together the opprobrious and ludicrous nickname of the rump stigmatized a faction which played the same part in the english revolution as the montagne of the jacobins did in the french it has been imagined that our english jacobins were impelled by a principle different from that of their modern rivals but the madness of avowed atheism and the frenzy of hypocritical sanctity in the circle of crimes meet at the same point 
their history forms one of those useful parallels where with truth as unerring as mathematical demonstration we discover the identity of human nature similarity of situation and certain principles producing similar personages and similar events finally settle in the same results the rump as long as human nature exists can be nothing but the rump however it may be thrown uppermost the origin of this political by-name has often been inquired into and it is somewhat curious that though all parties consent to reprobate it each assigns for it a different allusion in the history of political factions there is always a mixture of the ludicrous with the tragic but except their modern brothers no faction like the present ever excited such a combination of extreme contempt and extreme horror among the rival parties in sixteen fifty nine the loyalists and the presbyterians acted as we may suppose the tories and the whigs would in the same predicament a secret reconciliation had taken place to bury in oblivion their former jealousies that they might unite to rid themselves from that tyranny of tyrannies a hydra-headed government or as hume observes that all efforts should be used for the overthrow of the rump so they call the parliament in allusion to that part of the animal body the sarcasm of the allusion seemed obvious to our polished historian yet looking more narrowly for its origin we shall find how indistinct were the notions of this nickname among those who lived nearer to the times evelyn says that the rump parliament was so called as containing some few rotten members of the other roger coke describes it thus you must now be content with a piece of the commons called the rump and cart calls the rump the carcass of a house and seems not precisely aware of the contemptuous allusion but how do rotten members and a carcass agree with the notion of a rump recently the editor of the life of colonel hutchinson has conveyed a novel origin the number of the members of the long parliament having been by seclusion death etc very much reduced a remarkable etc this by which our editor seems adroitly to throw a veil over the forcible transportation by the rumpers of two hundred members at one swoop the remainder was compared to the rump of a fowl which was left all the rest being eaten our editor even considers this to be a coarse emblem yet the rump of a fowl could hardly offend even a lady's delicacy our editor probably was somewhat anxious not to degrade too lowly the anti-monarchical party designated by this opprobrious term perhaps it is pardonable in mrs macaulay an historical lady and a rumper for she called the levellers a brave and virtuous party to have passed over in her history any mention of the offensive term at all as well as the ridiculous catastrophe which they underwent in the political revolution which however we must beg leave not to pass by this party coinage has been ascribed to clement walker their bitter antagonist who having sacrificed no inconsiderable fortune to the cause of what he considered constitutional liberty was one of the violent ejected members of the long parliament and perished in prison a victim to honest unbending principles his history of independency is a rich legacy bequeathed to posterity of all their great misdoings and their petty villainies and above all of their secret history one likes to know of what blocks the idols of the people are sometimes carved out clement walker notices the votes and acts of this fag end this rump of a parliament with corrupt maggots in it this hideous but descriptive image of the rump had however got forward before for the collector of the rump songs tells us if you ask who named it rump no twas so styled in an honest sheet of prayer called the bloody rump 
written before the trial of our late sovereign but the word obtained not universal notice till it flew from the mouth of major-general brown at a public assembly in the days of richard cromwell thus it happens that a stinging nickname has been frequently applied to render a faction eternally odious and the chance expression of a wit when adopted on some public occasion circulates among a whole people the present nickname originated in derision on the expulsion of the majority of the long parliament by the usurping minority it probably slept for who would have stirred it through the protectorate and finally awakened at richard's restored but fleeting rump to witness its own ridiculous extinction our rump passed through three stages in its political progress preparatory to the trial of the sovereign the anti-monarchical party constituted the minority in the long parliament the very name by which this parliament is recognized seemed a grievance to an impatient people vacillating with chimerical projects of government and now accustomed from a wild indefinite notion of political equality to pull down all existing institutions such was the temper of the times that an act of the most violent injustice openly performed served only as the jest of the day a jest which has passed into history the forcible expulsion of two hundred of their brother members by those who afterwards were saluted as the rump was called pride's purge from the activity of a colonel of that name a military adventurer who was only the blind and brutal instrument of his party for when he stood at the door of the commons holding a paper with the names of the members he did not personally know one and his purge might have operated a quite opposite effect administered by his own unskilful hand had not lord grey of groby and the doorkeeper were the dispersers of the british senate pointed out the obnoxious members on whom our colonel laid his hand and sent off by his men to be detained if a bold member or to be deterred from sitting in the house if a frightened one this colonel had been a drayman and the contemptible knot of the commons reduced to fifty or sixty confederates which assembled after his purge were called colonel pride's dray horses it was this rump which voted the death of the sovereign and abolished the regal office in the house of peers as unnecessary burdensome and dangerous every office in parliament seemed dangerous but that of the custodes libertati angliae the keepers of the liberties of england or rather the jailers the legislative half-quarter of the house of commons indignantly exclaims clement walker the montagne of the french revolutionists the red-coats as the military were nicknamed soon taught their masters the rumpers silence and obedience the latter having raised one colossal man for their own purpose were annihilated by him at a single blow cromwell five years after turned them out of their house and put the keys into his pocket their last public appearance was in the fleeting days of richard cromwell when the comi tragedy of the rump concluded by a catastrophe as ludicrous as that of tom thumb's tragedy how such a faction used their instruments to gather in the common spoil and how their instruments at length converted the hands which held them into instruments themselves appears in their history when the long parliament opposed the designs of cromwell and ireton these chiefs cried up the liberty of the people and denied the authority of parliament but when they had effectuated their famous purge and formed a house of commons of themselves they abolished the house of lords crying up the supreme authority of the house of commons and crying down the liberty of the people such is the history of political factions as well as of statesmen charles v alternately made use of the pope's authority to subdue the rising spirit of the protestants of germany or raised an army of protestants to imprison the pope who branded his german allies by the novel and odious name of lutherans a chain of similar facts may be framed out of modern history the rump as they were called by every one but their own party became a whetstone for the wits to sharpen themselves on and we have two large collections of rump 
songs curious chronicles of popular feeling footnote the first collection ever formed of these political satires was printed in sixteen sixty with the quaint title of rats rhymed to death or the rump parliament hanged up in the shambles End of footnote without this evidence we should not have been so well informed respecting the phases of this portentous phenomenon the rump was celebrated in verse till at length it became the rump of a rump of a rump as Fouli traces them to their dwindled and grotesque appearance it is portrayed by a wit of the times the rump's an old story if well understood tis a thing dressed up in a parliament's hood and like it but the tail stands where the head should twould make a man scratch where it does not itch they say tis good luck when a body rises with the rump upwards but he that advises to live in that posture is none of the wisest cromwell's hunting them out of the house by military force is alluded to our politic doctors do us teach that a blood-sucking redcoat's as good as a leech to relieve the head if applied to the breech in the opening scene of the restoration mrs hutchinson an honest republican paints with dismay a scene otherwise very ludicrous when the town of nottingham as almost all the rest of the island began to grow mad and declared themselves in their desires of the king or as another of the opposite party writes when the soldiery who had hitherto made clubs trumps resolved now to turn up the king of hearts in their affections the rabble in town and country vied with each other in burning the rump and the liberal emblem was hung by chains on galaxies with a bonfire underneath while the cries of let us burn the rump let us roast the rump were echoed everywhere the suddenness of this universal change which was said to have maddened the wise and to have sobered the mad must be ascribed to the joy at escaping from the yoke of a military despotism perhaps too it marked the rapid transition of hope to a restoration which might be supposed to have implanted gratitude even in a royal breast the feelings of the people expected to find an echo from the throne the rump besides their general resemblance to the french anarchists had also some minuter features of ugliness which englishmen have often exalted have not marked an english revolution sanguinary proscriptions footnote in one of the popular political songs of the day the rump is aptly compared to the foxes of samson that carried a brand in their tails to destroy and to burn up the land End of footnote. we had thought that we had no revolutionary tribunals no septembrisers no noyades no movable guillotines awaiting for carts loaded with human victims no infuriated republican urging in a committee of public safety the necessity of a salutary massacre but if it be true that the same motives and the same principles were at work in both nations and that the like characters were performing in england the parts which they did afterwards in france by an argument a priori we might be sure that the same revolting crimes and chimerical projects were alike suggested at london as at paris human nature even in transactions which appear unparalleled will be found to preserve a regularity of resemblance not always suspected the first great tragic act was closely copied by the french and if the popular page of our history appears unstained by their revolutionary acts this depended only on a slight accident for it became a question of yea and nay and was only carried in the negative by two voices in the council it was debated among the bloody rump as it was hideously designated whether to massacre and to put to the sword all the king's party cromwell himself listened to the suggestion and it was only put down by the coolness of political calculation the dread that the massacre would be too general some of the rump not obtaining the blessedness of a massacre still clung to the happiness of an immolation and many petitions were presented that two or three principal gentlemen of the royal party in each county might be sacrificed to justice whereby the land might be saved from blood guiltiness sir arthur haslerig whose passionate fondness of liberty has been commended 
was one of the committee of safety in sixteen forty seven i too would commend a passionate lover of liberty whenever i do not discover that this lover is much more intent on the dower than on the bride hasselrig an absurd bold man as clarendon at a single stroke reveals his character was resolved not to be troubled with king or bishop or with any power in the state superior to the rumps we may safely suspect the patriot who can cool his vehemence in spoliation hasselrig would have no bishops but this was not from any want of reverence for church lands for he heaped for himself such wealth as to have been nicknamed the bishop of durham he is here noticed for a political crime different from that of plunder when in sixteen forty seven this venerable radical found the parliament resisting his views he declared that some heads must fly off adding the parliament cannot save england we must look another way threatening what afterwards was done to bring in the army it was this passionate lover of liberty who when dorus Slaeus, the parliamentary agent was assassinated by some scotchmen in holland moved in the house that six royalists of the best quality should be immediately executed when some northern counties petitioned the commons for relief against a famine in the land our meritist observed that this want of food would best defend these counties from scottish invasion the slaughter of drogheda by cromwell and his frightening all london by what walker calls a butchery of apprentices when he cried out to his soldiers to kill man woman and child and fire the city may be placed among those crimes which are committed to open a reign of terror but hugh peters's solemn thanksgiving to heaven that none were spared was the true expression of the true feeling of these political demoniacs cromwell was cruel from politics others from constitution some were willing to be cruel without blood guiltiness one alexander rigby a radical lawyer twice moved in the long parliament that those lords and gentlemen who were malignants should be sold as slaves to the day of algiers or sent off to the new plantations in the west indies he had all things prepared for it is added that he had contracted with two merchants to ship them off there was a most bloody-minded maker of washing balls as one john durant is described appointed a lecturer by the house of commons who always left out of the lord's prayer as we forgive them that trespass against us and substituted lord since thou hast now drawn out thy sword let it not be sheathed again till it be glutted in the blood of the malignants i find too many enormities of this kind cursed be he that doeth the work of the lord negligently and keepeth back his sword from blood was the cry of the wretch who when a celebrated actor and royalist sued for quarter gave no other reply than that of fitting the action to the word Footnote. this actor was a comedian named robinson of the black friars theatre the performers there being termed the king's servants in the civil wars most of the young actors deprived of living by their profession all theatres being closed by order of the parliament went into the king's army robinson was fighting at the siege of basing house in hampshire october sixteen forty five when after an obstinate defence his party was defeated he laid down his arms suing for quarter but was shot through the head by colonel harrison as he repeated the words quoted above End of footnote their treatment of the irish may possibly be admired by a true machiavellist they permitted forty thousand of the irish to enlist in the service of the kings of spain and france in other words they expelled them at once which considering that our rumpers affected such an abhorrence of tyranny may be considered as an act of mercy satisfying themselves only with dividing the forfeited lands of the aforesaid forty thousand among their own party by lot and other means an universal confiscation after all is a bloodless massacre they use the scots soldiers after the battles of dunbar and worcester a little differently but equally efficaciously for they sold their scotch prisoners for slaves to the american planters footnote the following account is drawn from sir william dugdale's interleave pocket-book for sixteen forty eight august seventeenth the scotch army under the command of duke hamilton defeated at preston and lancashire twenty fourth the moorlanders rose upon the scots and stripped some of them the scotch prisoners miserably used exposed to eat cabbage leaves in ridgely staffordshire and carrot tops in coleshill warwickshire 
the soldiers who guarded them sold the victuals which were brought in for them from the country End of footnote. the robes pierres and the marats were as extraordinary beings and in some respects the frenchmen were working on a more enlarged scheme these discovered that the generation which had witnessed the preceding one would always regret it and for the security of the revolution it was necessary that every person who was thirty years old in seventeen eighty eight should perish on the scaffold the anarchists were intent on reducing the french people to eight millions and on destroying the great cities of france footnote desodard's histoire philosophique de la revolution de france quatre cinq when lyon was captured in seventeen ninety three the revolutionary army nearly reduced this fine city to a heap of ruins in obedience to the decree of the montagne who had ordered its name to be effaced that it should henceforth be termed commune à Franchi, and upon its ruins a column erected and inscribed lyon fit la guerre à la liberté lyon n'est plus End of footnote such monstrous persons and events are not credible but there is no proof that they have not occurred many incredible things will happen another disorganizing feature in the english rumpers was also observed in the french chant coulette their hatred of literature and the arts hibert was one day directing his satellites towards the bibliothque nationale to put an end to all that human knowledge had collected for centuries on centuries in one day alleging of course some good reason this hero was only diverted from the enterprise by being persuaded to postpone it for a day or two when luckily the guillotine intervened the same circumstance occurred here the burning of the records in the tower was certainly proposed a speech of selden's which i cannot immediately turn to put a stop to these incendiaries it was debated in the rump parliament when cromwell was general whether they should dissolve the universities they concluded that no university was necessary that there were no ancient examples of such education and that scholars in other countries did study at their own cost and charges and therefore they looked on them as unnecessary and thought them fitting to be taken away for the public use how these venerable asylums escaped from being sold with the king's pictures as stone and timber and why their rich endowments were not shared among such inveterate ignorance and remorseless spoliation might claim some inquiry the abbe Morier, a great political economist imagined that the source of all the crimes of the french revolution was their violation of the sacred rights of property the perpetual invectives of the sans culette of france against proprietors and against property proceeded from demoralized beings who formed panegyrics on all crimes crimes to explain whose revolutionary terms a new dictionary was required but even these anarchists and their mad expressions against property and in their wildest notions of their egalite have not gone beyond the daring of our own rumpers of those revolutionary journals of the parliament of sixteen forty nine which in spirit so strongly resemble the diurnal or hebdomadal effusions of the redoubtable french hebert marat and others of that stamp one of the most remarkable is the moderate impartially communicating martial affairs to the kingdom of england the monarchical title our commonwealth men had not yet had time enough to obliterate from their colloquial style this writer called himself in his barbarous english the moderate it would be hard to conceive the meanness and illiteracy to which the english language was reduced under the pens of the rabble writers of these days had we not witnessed in the present time a parallel to their compositions the moderate was a title assumed on the principle on which marat denominated himself l'ami du peuple it is curious that the most ferocious politicians usually assert their moderation robespierre in his justification declares that marat m'a souvent accusé de madarantisme the same actors playing the same parts may be always paralleled in their language and their deeds this moderate steadily pursued one great principle the overthrow of all property assuming that property was the original cause of sin an exhortation to these people for this purpose is the subject of the present paper footnote the moderate 
from tuesday july thirty one to august seven sixteen forty nine in the footnote the illustration of his principle is as striking as the principle itself it is an apology for or rather a defence of robbery some moss troopers have been condemned to be hanged for practising their venerable custom of gratuitously supplying themselves from the flocks and herds of their weaker neighbours our moderate ingeniously discovers that the loss of these men's lives is to be attributed to nothing but property they are necessitated to offend the laws in order to obtain a livelihood on this he descants and the extract is a political curiosity in the french style property is the original cause of any sin between party and party as to civil transactions and since the tyrant is taken off and the government altered in nomine so ought it really to redound to the good of the people in specie which though they cannot expect it in few years by reason of the multiplicity of the gentlemen in authority command etc who drive on all designs for support of the old government and consequently their own interest in the people's slavery yet they doubt not but in time the people will herein discern their own blindness and folly in september he advanced with more depth of thought wars have ever been clothed with the most gracious pretenses viz reformation of religion the laws of the land the liberty of the subject etc though the effects thereof have proved most destructive to every nation making the sword and not the people the original of all authorities for many hundred years together taking away each man's birthright and settling upon a few accursed propriety the ground of all civil offences and the greatest cause of most sins against the heavenly deity this tyranny and oppression running through the veins of many of our predecessors and being too long maintained by the sword upon a royal foundation at last became so customary as to the vulgar it seemed most natural the only reason why the people of this time are so ignorant of their birthright their only freedom etc the birthright of citoyen egalite to a cursed propriety settled on a few was not even among the french jacobins urged with more amazing force had things proceeded according to our moderates plan the people's slavery had been something worse in a short time the nation would have had more proprietors than property we have a curious list of the spoliations of those members of the house of commons who after their famous self-denying ordinances appropriated among themselves sums of money offices and lands for services done or to be done the most innocent of this new government of the majesty of the people were those whose talents had been limited by nature to peddle and purloin puny mechanics who had suddenly dropped their needles their hammers and their lasts and slunk out from behind their shop counters those who had never aspired beyond the constable of the parish were now seated in the council of state whereas milton describes them they fell to huckster the commonwealth there they met a more rabid race of obscure lawyers and discontented men of family of blasted reputations adventurers who were to command the militia and navy of england governors of the three kingdoms whose votes and ordinances resounded with nothing else but new impositions new taxes excises yearly monthly weekly sequestrations compositions and universal robbery baxter vents one deep groan of indignation and presciently announces one future consequence of reform in all this appeared the severity of god the mutability of worldly things and the fruits of error pride and selfishness to be charged hereafter upon reformation and religion as a statesman the sagacity of this honest prophet was narrowed by the horizon of his religious views for he ascribes the whole as prepared by satan to the injury of the protestant cause and the advantage of the papists but dropping his particular application to the devil and the papists honest richard baxter is perfectly right in his general principle concerning rumpers sans culottes and radicals End of section 60.
section sixty one of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli life and habits of a literary antiquary oldis and his manuscripts part one such a picture may be furnished by some unexpected materials which my inquiries have obtained of oldest this is a sort of personage little known to the wits who write more than they read and to their volatile votaries who only read what the wits write it is time to vindicate the honours of the few whose laborious days enrich the stores of national literature not by the duplicates but the supplements of knowledge a literary antiquary is that idler whose life is passed in a perpetual voyage autour de ma chambre fervent in sagacious diligence instinct with the enthusiasm of curious inquiry critical as well as erudite he has to arbitrate between contending opinions to resolve the doubtful to clear up the obscure and to grasp at the remote so busied with other times and so interested for other persons than those about him that he becomes the inhabitant of the visionary world of books he counts only his days by his acquisitions and may be said by his original discoveries to be the creator of facts often exciting the gratitude of the literary world while the very name of the benefactor has not always descended with the inestimable labours such is the man whom we often find leaving when he dies his favourite volumes only an incomplete project and few of this class of literary men have escaped the fate reserved for most of their brothers voluminous works have been usually left unfinished by the death of the authors and it is with them as with the planting of trees of which johnson has forcibly observed there is a frightful interval between the seed and timber and he admirably remarks what i cannot forbear applying to the labours i am now to describe he that calculates the growth of trees has the remembrance of the shortness of life driven hard upon him he knows that he is doing what will never benefit himself and where he rejoices to see the stem rise is disposed to repine that another shall cut it down the days of the patriotic count mazzuchelli were freely given to his national literature and six invaluable folios attest the gigantic force of his immense erudition yet these only carry us through the letters a and b and though mazzuchelli had finished for the press other volumes the torpor of his descendants has defrauded europe of her claims Footnote his intention was to publish a general classified biography of all the italian authors End of footnote. the abbe gouget who had designed a classified history of his national literature in the eighteen volumes we possess could only conclude that of the translators and commence that of the poets two other volumes in manuscript have perished that great enterprise of the benedictines the histoire littéraire de la france now consists of twelve large quartos and the industry of its successive writers has only been able to carry it to the twelfth century david clement designed the most extensive bibliography which had ever appeared but the diligent life of the writer could only proceed as far as h the alphabetical order which so many writers of this class have adopted has proved a mortifying memento of human life tiraboski was so fortunate as to complete his great national history of italian literature but unhappily for us thomas wharton after feeling his way through the darker ages of our poetry in planning the map of the beautiful land of which he had only a pisgah sight expired amidst his volumes
the most precious portion of wharton's history is but the fragment of a fragment oldys among this brotherhood has met perhaps with a harder fate his published works and the numerous ones to which he contributed are now highly appreciated by lovers of books but the larger portion of his literary labours have met with the sad fortune of dispersed and probably of wasted manuscripts oldys's manuscripts or o m as they are sometimes designated are constantly referred to by every distinguished writer on our literary history i believe that not one of them could have given us any positive account of the manuscripts themselves they have indeed long served as the solitary sources of information but like the well at the wayside too many have drawn their waters in silence oldys is chiefly known by the caricature of the facetious gross a great humorist both with pencil and with pen it is in a posthumous scrap-book where gross deposited his odds and ends and where there is perhaps not a single story which is not satirical our lively antiquary who cared more for rusty armour than for rusty volumes would turn over these flams and quips to some confidential friend to enjoy together a secret laugh at their literary intimates his eager executor who happened to be his bookseller served up the poignant hash to the public as gross's olio footnote he says in his advertisement it will be difficult to ascertain whether he meant to give them to the public or only to reserve them for his own amusement and the entertainment of his friends many of these anecdotes are evidently mere loose scandal End of footnote the delineation of oldys is sufficiently overcharged for the nonce one prevalent infirmity of honest oldys his love of companionship over too social a glass sends him down to posterity in a grotesque attitude and mr alexander chalmers who has given us the fullest account of oldys has inflicted on him something like a sermon on a state of intoxication alas oldys was an outcast of fortune footnote gross narrates his early history thus his parents dying when he was very young he soon squandered away his small patrimony when he became at first an attendant in lord oxford's library and afterwards librarian at whose death he was obliged to write for the booksellers for a subsistence in the footnote and the utter simplicity of his heart was guileless as a child's ever open to the designing the noble spirit of a duke of norfolk once rescued the long-lost historian of raleigh from the confinement of the fleet where he had existed probably forgotten by the world for six years it was by an act of grace that the duke safely placed oldys in the herald's college as norroy king of arms footnote mr john taylor the son of oldys's intimate friend has furnished me with this interesting anecdote oldys as my father informed me was many years in quiet obscurity in the fleet prison but at last was spirited up to make his situation known to the duke of norfolk of that time who received oldys's letter while he was at dinner with some friends the duke immediately communicated the contents to the company observing that he had long been anxious to know what had become of an old though an humble friend and was happy by that letter to find that he was alive he then called for his gentleman a kind of humble friend whom noblemen used to retain under that name in those days and desired him to go immediately to the fleet to take money for the immediate need of oldys to procure an account of his debts and discharge them oldys was soon after either by the duke's gift or interest appointed norroy king of arms and i remember that his official regalia came into my father's hands at his death in the life of oldys by mr a chalmers the date of this promotion is not found my accomplished friend the rev j dalloway has obligingly examined the records of the college by which it appears that oldys had been norfolk herald extraordinary 
but not belonging to the college was appointed per saltum norroy king of arms by patent may fifth seventeen fifty five gross says the patronage of the duke occasioned a suspicion of his being a papist though i think really without reason this for a while retarded his appointment it was underhand propagated by the heralds who were vexed at having a stranger put in upon them End of footnote but oldest like all shy and retired men had contracted peculiar habits and close attachments for a few both these he could indulge at no distance he liked his old associates in the purlieus of the fleet whom he facetiously dignified as his rulers and there as i have heard with the grotesque whim of a herald established the dragon club companionship yields the poor man unpurchased pleasures oldest busied every morning among the departed wits and the learned of our country reflected some image from them of their wit and learning to his companions a secret history as yet untold an ancient wit which cleared of the rust seemed to him brilliant as the modern it is hard however for a literary antiquary to be caricatured and for a herald to be ridiculed about an unseemly reeling with the coronet of the princess caroline which looked unsteady on the cushion to the great scandal of his brethren a circumstance which could never have occurred at the burial of a prince or princess as the coronet is carried by clarencier and not by norroy oldys's deep potations of ale however gave me an opportunity of bestowing on him the honour of being the author of a popular anacreontic song mr taylor informs me that oldys always asserted that he was the author of the well-known song busy curious thirsty fly and as he was a rigid lover of truth i doubt not that he wrote it my own researches confirm it i have traced this popular song through a dozen of collections since the year seventeen forty the first in which i find it in the later collections an original inscription has been dropped which the accurate ritson has restored without however being able to discover the writer in seventeen forty it is said to have been made extempore by a gentleman occasioned by a fly drinking out of his cup of ale the accustomed potion of poor oldest footnote the beautiful simplicity of this anacreontic has met the unusual fate of entirely losing its character by an additional and incongruous stanza in the modern editions by a gentleman who has put into practice the unallowable liberty of altering the poetical and dramatic compositions of acknowledged genius to his own notion of what he deems morality but in works of genius whatever is dull ceases to be moral the fly of oldest may stand by the fly of gray for melancholy tenderness of thought it consisted only of these two stanzas busy curious thirsty fly drink with me and drink as i freely welcome to my cup couldst thou sip and sip it up make the most of life you may life is short and wears away both alike are mine and thine hastening quick to their decline thine's a summer mine no more though repeated to three score three score summers when they're gone will appear as short as one End of footnote gross however though a great joker on the peculiarities of oldest was far from insensible to the extraordinary acquisitions of the man his knowledge of english books has hardly been exceeded gross too was struck by the delicacy of honour and the unswerving veracity which so strongly characterised oldest of which he gives a remarkable instance footnote this anecdote should be given in justice to both parties and in gross's words who says he was a man of great good nature honour and integrity particularly in his character of an historian nothing i firmly believe would ever have biased him to insert any fact in his writings he did not believe or to suppress any he did 
of this delicacy he gave an instance at a time when he was in great distress after his publication of the life of sir walter raleigh some booksellers thinking his name would sell a piece they were publishing offered him a considerable sum to father it which he rejected with the greatest indignation in the footnote we are concerned in ascertaining the moral integrity of the writer whose main business is with history at a time when our literary history excepting in the solitary labour of anthony wood was a forest with neither road nor pathway oldest fortunately placed in the library of the earl of oxford yielded up his entire days to researches concerning the books and the men of the preceding age his labours were then valueless their very nature not yet ascertained and when he opened the treasures of our ancient lore in the british librarian it was closed for want of public encouragement our writers then struggling to create an age of genius of their own forgot that they had had any progenitors or while they were acquiring new modes of excellence that they were losing others to which their posterity or the national genius might return to know and to admire only the literature and the tastes of our own age is a species of elegant barbarism footnote we have been taught to enjoy the two ages of genius and of taste the literary public are deeply indebted to the editorial care the taste and the enthusiasm of mr singer for exquisite reprints of some valuable writers End of footnote spenser was considered nearly as obsolete as chaucer milton was veiled by oblivion and shakespeare's dramas were so imperfectly known that in looking over the playbills of seventeen eleven and much later i find that whenever it chanced that they were acted they were always announced to have been written by shakespeare massinger was unknown and johnson though called immortal in the old playbills lay entombed in his two folios the poetical era of elizabeth the eloquent age of james i and the age of wit of charles the second were blanks in our literary history bish compiling an art of poetry in seventeen eighteen passed by in his collection spenser and the poets of his age because their language is now become so obsolete that most readers of our age have no ear for them and therefore shakespeare himself is so rarely cited in my collection the best english poets were considered to be the modern a taste which is always obstinate all this was nothing to oldys his literary curiosity anticipated by half a century the fervour of the present day this energetic direction of all his thoughts was sustained by that life of discovery which in literary researches is starting novelties among old and unremembered things contemplating some ancient tract as precious as a manuscript or revelling in the volume of a poet whose passport of fame was yet yet delayed in its way or disinterring the treasure of some secluded manuscript whence he drew a virgin extract or raising up a sort of domestic intimacy with the eminent in arms in politics and in literature in this visionary life life itself with oldest was insensibly gliding away its cares almost unfelt the life of a literary antiquary partakes of the nature of those who having no concerns of their own busy themselves with those of others oldest lived in the back ages of england he had crept among the dark passages of time till like an old gentleman usher he seemed to be reporting the secret history of the courts which he had lived in he had been charmed among their masks and revels had eyed with astonishment their cumbrous magnificence when knights and ladies carried on their mantles and their cloth of gold ten thousand pounds worth of ropes of pearls and buttons of diamonds or descending to the gay court of the second charles he tattled merry tales as in that of the first he had painfully watched like a patriot or a loyalist 
a distempered era he had lived so constantly with these people of another age and had so deeply interested himself in their affairs and so loved the wit and the learning which are often bright under the rust of antiquity that his own uncourtly style is embrowned with the tint of a century old but it was this taste and curiosity which alone could have produced the extraordinary volume of sir walter raleigh's life a work richly inlaid with the most curious facts and the juxtaposition of the most remote knowledge to judge by its fulness of narrative it would seem rather to have been the work of a contemporary footnote gibbon once meditated a life of raleigh and for that purpose began some researches in that memorable era of our english annals after reading oldys's he relinquished his design from a conviction that he could add nothing new to the subject except the uncertain merit of style and sentiment End of footnote it was an advantage in this primeval era of literary curiosity that those volumes which are now not even to be found in our national library where certainly they are perpetually wanted and which are now so excessively appreciated were exposed on stalls through the reigns of anne and the two georges footnote the british museum is extremely deficient in our national literature the gift of george the third's library has however probably supplied many deficiencies the recent bequest of the grenville collection and the constant search made of late years for these relics of early literature by the officers of our great national library has greatly altered the state of the collection since the above was written s dash editor in the footnote oldys encountered no competitor cased in the invulnerable mail of his purse to dispute his possession of the rarest volume on the other hand our early collector did not possess our advantages he could not fly for instant aid to a biographia britannica he had no history of our poetry nor even of our drama oldys could tread in no man's path for every soil about him was unbroken ground he had to create everything for his own purposes we gather fruit from trees which others have planted and too often we but pluck and eat nulla die sine linea was his sole hope while he was accumulating masses of notes and as oldys never used his pen from the weak passion of scribbling but from the urgency of preserving some substantial knowledge or planning some future inquiry he amassed nothing but what he wished to remember even the minuter pleasures of settling a date or classifying a title page were enjoyments to his incessant pen everything was acquisition this never-ending business of research appears to have absorbed his powers and sometimes to have dulled his conceptions no one more aptly exercised the tact of discovery he knew where to feel in the dark but he was not of the race that race indeed had not yet appeared among us who could melt into their corinthian brass the mingled treasures of research imagination and philosophy we may be curious to inquire where our literary antiquary deposited the discoveries and curiosities which he was so incessantly acquiring they were dispersed on many a fly-leaf in occasional memorandum books in ample marginal notes on his authors they were sometimes thrown into what he calls his parchment budgets or bags of biography of botany of obituary of books relative to london and other titles and bags which he was every day filling footnote gross says his mode of composing was somewhat singular he had a number of small parchment bags inscribed with the names of the persons whose lives he intended to write into these bags he put every circumstance and anecdote he could collect and from thence drew up his history End of footnote sometimes his collections seem to have been intended for a series of volumes for he refers to my first volume of tables of the eminent persons celebrated by english poets 
to another of poetical characteristics among those manuscripts which i have seen i find one mentioned apparently of a wide circuit under the reference of my biographical institutions part third containing a catalogue of all the english lives with historical and critical observations on them but will our curious or our whimsical collectors of the present day endure without impatience the loss of a quarto manuscript which bears this rich condiment for its title of london libraries with anecdotes of collectors of books remarks on booksellers and on the first publishers of catalogues oldys left ample annotations on fuller's worthies and winstanley's lives of the poets and on langbaine's dramatic poets the late mr boswell showed me a fuller in the malone collection with stevens's transcriptions of oldys's notes which malone purchased for forty three pounds at stevens's sale but where is the original copy of oldys though when stanley i think also reposes in the same collection the langbaine is far famed and is preserved in the british museum the gift of dr birch it has been considered so precious that several of our eminent writers have cheerfully passed through the labour of a minute transcription of its numberless notes in the history of the fate and fortune of books that of oldys's langbaine is too curious to omit oldys may tell his own story which i find in the museum copy page three hundred and thirty six and which copy appears to be a second attempt for of the first langbaine we have this account when i left london in seventeen twenty four to reside in yorkshire i left in the care of the rev mr burridge's family with whom i had several years lodged among many other books goods etc a copy of this langbaine in which i had wrote several notes and references to further knowledge of these poets when i returned to london seventeen thirty i understood my books had been dispersed and afterwards becoming acquainted with mr t coxeter i found that he had bought my langbaine of a bookseller who was a great collector of plays and poetical books this must have been of service to him and he has kept it so carefully from my sight that i never could have the opportunity of transcribing into this i am now writing in the notes i had collected in that footnote at the bodleian library i learnt by a letter with which i am favoured by the rev dr bliss that there is an interleaved gildan's lives and characters of the dramatic poets with corrections which once belonged to coxeter who appears to have intended a new edition whether coxeter transcribed into his gildan the notes of oldys's first langbaine is worth inquiry coxeter's conduct though he had purchased oldys's first langbaine was that of an ungenerous miser who will quarrel with a brother rather than share in any acquisition he can get into his own hands to coxeter we also owe much he suggested dodsley's collection of old plays and the first tolerable edition of massinger oldys could not have been employed in lord oxford's library as mr chalmers conjectures about seventeen twenty six for here he mentions that he was in yorkshire from seventeen twenty four to seventeen thirty this period is a remarkable blank in oldys's life my learned friend the rev joseph hunter has supplied me with a note in the copy of fuller in the malone collection preserved at the bodleian those years were passed apparently in the household of the first earl of malton who built wentworth house there all the collections of the antiquary gascoigne with seven great chests of manuscripts some as ancient as the time of the conquest were condemned in one solemn sacrifice to vulcan the ruthless earl being impenetrable to the prayers and remonstrances of our votary to english history oldys left the earl with little satisfaction as appears by some severe strictures from his gentle pen End of footnote the first langbaine with additions by coxeter was bought at the sale of his books by theophilus cibber on the strength of these notes he prefixed his name to the first collection of the lives of our poets which appeared in weekly numbers and now form five volumes written chiefly by shields an amanuensis of dr johnson shields has been recently castigated by mr gifford
these literary jobbers nowhere distinguished coxeter's and oldys's curious matter from their own such was the fate of the first copy of langbaine with oldys's notes but the second is more important at an auction of some of oldys's books and manuscripts of which i have seen a printed catalogue dr birch purchased this invaluable copy for three shillings and sixpence footnote this copy was lent by dr birch to the late bishop of dromore who with his own hand carefully transcribed the notes into an interleaved copy of langbaine divided into four volumes which as i am informed narrowly escaped the flames and was injured by the water at a fire at northumberland house his lordship when he went to ireland left this copy with mr nicholls for the use of the projected edition of the tatler the spectator and the guardian with notes and illustrations of which i think the tatler only has appeared and to which his lordship contributed some valuable communications in the footnote such was the value attached to these original researches concerning our poets and of which to obtain only a transcript very large sums have since been cheerfully given the museum copy of langbaine is in oldys's handwriting not interleaved but overflowing with notes written in a very small hand about the margins and inserted between the lines nor may the transcriber pass negligently even its corners otherwise he is here assured that he will lose some useful date or the hint of some curious reference the enthusiasm and diligence of oldys in in undertaking a repetition of his first lost labour proved to be infinitely greater than the sense of his unrequited labours such is the history of the escapes the changes and the fate of the volume which forms the groundwork of the most curious information concerning our elder poets and to which we must still frequently refer End of section sixty one Section 62 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 by Isaac Disraeli. Life and Habits of a Literary Antiquary oldest and his manuscripts part two in this variety of literary arrangements which we must consider as single works in a progressive state or as portions of one great work on our modern literary history it may perhaps be justly suspected that oldest in the delight of perpetual acquisition impeded the happier labour of unity of design and completeness of purpose he was not a tiraboski nor even a niceron he was sometimes chilled by neglect and by vanity and vexation of spirit else we should not now have to count over a barren list of manuscript works masses of literary history of which the existence is even doubtful in kippis's biographia britannica we find frequent references to o m oldys's manuscripts mr john taylor the son of the friend and executor of oldys has greatly obliged me with all his recollections of this man of letters whose pursuits however were in no manner analogous to his and whom he could only have known in youth by him i learned that on the death of oldys dr kippis editor of the biographia britannica looked over these manuscripts at mr taylor's house he had been directed to this discovery by the late bishop of dromore whose active zeal was very remarkable in every enterprise to enlarge our literary history kippis was one who in some degree might have estimated their literary value but employed by commercial men and negotiating with persons who neither comprehended their nature nor affixed any value to them the editor of the biographia found oldys's manuscripts an easy purchase for his employer the late mr cadell 
and the twenty guineas perhaps served to bury their writer mr taylor says the manuscripts of oldest were not so many as might be expected from so indefatigable a writer they consisted chiefly of short extracts from books and minutes of dates and were thought worth purchasing by the doctor i remember the manuscripts well though oldest was not the author but rather recorder such is the statement and the opinion of a writer whose effusions are of a gayer sort but the researches of oldest must not be estimated by this standard with him a single line was the result of many a day of research and a leaf of scattered hints would supply more original knowledge than some octavos fashioned out by the hasty gilders and varnishers of modern literature these discoveries occupy small space to the eye but large works are composed out of them this very lot of oldys's manuscripts was indeed so considerable in the judgment of kippis that he has described them as a large and useful body of biographical materials left by mr oldys were these the biographical institutes oldys refers to among his manuscripts the late mr malone continues mr taylor told me that he had seen all oldys's manuscripts so i presume they are in the hands of cadell and davies have they met with the fate of sucked oranges and how much of malone may we owe to oldys this information enabled me to trace the manuscripts of oldys to dr kippis but it cast me among the booksellers who do not value manuscripts which no one can print i discovered by the late mr davies that the direction of that hapless work in our literary history with its whole treasure of manuscripts had been consigned by mr cadell to the late george robinson and that the successor of dr kippis had been the late dr george gregory again i repeat the history of voluminous works is a melancholy office every one concerned with them no longer can be found the esteemed relic of dr gregory with a friendly promptitude gratified my anxious inquiries and informed me that she perfectly recollects a mass of papers such as i describe being returned on the death of dr gregory to the house of wilkie and robinson in the early part of the year eighteen hundred and nine i applied to this house who after some time referred me to mr john robinson the representative of his late father and with whom all the papers of the former partnership were deposited but mr john robinson has terminated my inquiries by his civility in promising to comply with them and his pertinacity in not doing so he may have injured his own interest in not trading with my curiosity footnote i know that not only this lot of oldys's manuscripts but a great quantity of original contributions of whole lives intended for the biographia britannica must lie together unless they have been destroyed as waste paper these biographical and literary curiosities were often supplied by the families or friends of eminent persons some may perhaps have been reclaimed by their owners i am informed there was among them an interesting collection of the correspondence of locke and i could mention several lives which were prepared in the footnote it was fortunate for the nation that george vertu's mass of manuscripts escaped the fate of oldys's had the possessor proved as indolent horace walpole would not have been the writer of his most valuable work and we should have lost the anecdotes of painting of which vertu had collected the materials 
of a life consumed in such literary activity we should have known more had the diaries of oldest escaped destruction one habit of my father's old friend william oldys says mr taylor was that of keeping a diary and recording in it every day all the events that occurred and all his engagements and the employment of his time i have seen piles of these books but know not what became of them the existence of such diaries is confirmed by a sale catalogue of thomas davies the literary bookseller who sold many of the books and some manuscripts of oldest which appear to have been dispersed in various libraries i find lot three thousand six hundred and twenty seven mr oldys's diary containing several observations relating to books characters etc a single volume which appears to have separated from the piles which mr taylor once witnessed the literary diaries of oldys could have exhibited the mode of his pursuits and the results of his discoveries one of these volumes i have fortunately discovered and a singularity in this writer's feelings throws a new interest over such diurnal records oldys was apt to give utterance with his pen to his most secret emotions querulous or indignant his honest simplicity confided to the paper before him such extemporaneous soliloquies and i found him hiding in the very corners of his manuscripts his secret sorrows a few of these slight memorials of his feelings will exhibit a sort of silhouette likeness traced by his own hand when at times the pensive man seems to have contemplated his own shadow oldys would throw down in verses whose humility or quaintness indicates their origin or by some pithy adage or apt quotation or recording anecdote his self-advice or his self-regrets oppressed by a sense of task so unprofitable to himself while his days were often passed in trouble and in prison he breathes a self-reproach in one of these profound reflections of melancholy which so often startle the man of study who truly discovers that life is too limited to acquire real knowledge with the ambition of dispensing it to the world i say who too long in these cobwebs lurks is always wetting tools but never works in one of the corners of his notebooks i find this curious but sad reflection alas this is but the apron of a fig-leaf but the curtain of a cobweb sometimes he seems to have anticipated the fate of that obscure diligence which was pursuing discoveries reserved for others to use he heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them fond treasurer of these stores behold thy fate in psalm the thirty ninth sixth seven and eight sometimes he checks the eager ardour of his pen and reminds himself of its repose in latin italian and english non we sed saipe cadendo assai presto si fa quel che si fa bene some respite best recovers what we need discreetly baiting gives the journey speed there was a thoughtless kindness in honest oldys and his simplicity of character as i have observed was practised on by the artful or the ungenerous we regret to find the following entry concerning the famous collector james west i gave above threescore letters of dr davenant to his son who was envoy at frankfort in seventeen hundred and three to seventeen hundred and eight to mr james west footnote this collection and probably the other letters have come down to us no doubt with the manuscripts of this collector 
purchased for the british museum the correspondence of dr davenant the political writer with his son the envoy turns on one perpetual topic his son's and his own advancement in the state End of footnote. with one hundred and fifty more about christmas seventeen forty six but the same fate they found as grain that is sown in barren ground such is the plaintive record by which oldest relieved himself of a groan we may smile at the simplicity of the following narrative where poor oldest received manuscripts in lieu of money old counsellor fane of colchester who in forma pauperis deceived me of a good sum of money which he owed me and not long after set up his chariot gave me a parcel of manuscripts and promised me others which he never gave me nor anything else besides a barrel of oysters and a manuscript copy of randolph's poems an original as he said with many additions being devolved to him as the author's relation there was no end to his aids and contributions to every author or bookseller who applied to him yet he had reason to complain of both while they were using his invaluable but not valued knowledge here is one of these diurnal entries i lent the tragical lives and deaths of the famous pirates ward and Dansiker, quarto london sixteen twelve by robert dayborn alias dayborn to mr t lediard whom when he was writing his naval history and he never returned it see howe's letters of them in another when his friend t hayward was collecting for his british muse the most exquisite commonplaces of our old english dramatists a compilation which must not be confounded with ordinary ones oldest not only assisted in the labour but drew up a curious introduction with a knowledge and love of the subject which none but himself possessed but so little were these researches then understood that we find oldest in a moment of vexatious recollection and in a corner of one of the margins of his langbane accidentally preserving an extraordinary circumstance attending this curious dissertation oldest having completed this elaborate introduction the penurious publisher insisted on leaving out one third part which happened to be the best matter in it because he would have it contracted into one sheet poor oldest never could forget the fate of this elaborate dissertation on all the collections of english poetry i am confident that i have seen some volume which was formerly oldest's and afterwards thomas wharton's in the possession of my intelligent friend mr deuce in the fly-leaf of which oldest has expressed himself in these words in my historical and critical review of all the collections of this kind it would have made a sheet and a half or two sheets but they for sordid gain and to save a little expense in print and paper got mr john campbell to cross it and cramp it and play the devil with it till they squeezed it into less compass than a sheet this is a loss which we may never recover the curious book knowledge of this singular man of letters those stores of which he was the fond treasurer as he says with such tenderness for his pursuits were always ready to be cast into the forms of a dissertation or an introduction and when morgan published his collection of rare tracts the friendly hand of oldest furnished a dissertation upon pamphlets in a letter to a nobleman probably the earl of oxford a great literary curiosity and in the harleian collection he has given a catalogue raisonne of six hundred when mrs cooper attempted the muses library the first essay which influenced the national taste to return to our deserted poets in our most poetical age it was oldest who only could have enabled this lady to perform that task so well footnote 
it is a stout octavo volume of four hundred pages containing a good selection of specimens from the earliest era concluding with samuel daniel in the reign of james i mrs elizabeth cooper was the wife of an auctioneer who had been a chum of oldys's in the fleet prison where he died a debtor and it was to aid his widow that oldys edited this book End of footnote. when curl the publisher to help out one of his hasty compilations a history of the stage repaired like all the world to oldys whose kindness could not resist the importunity of this busy publisher he gave him a life of nell gwynn while at the same moment oldys could not avoid noticing in one of his usual entries an intended work on the stage which we seem never to have had dick leverage's history of the stage and actors in his own time for these forty or fifty years past as he told me he had composed is likely to prove whenever it shall appear a more perfect work i might proceed with many similar gratuitous contributions with which he assisted his contemporaries oldys should have been constituted the reader of the nation his comte rendu of books and manuscripts are still held precious but his useful and curious talent had sought the public patronage in vain from one of his diaries which has escaped destruction i transcribe some interesting passages ad verbum the reader is here presented with a minute picture of those invisible occupations which pass in the study of a man of letters there are those who may be surprised as well as amused in discovering how all the business even to the very disappointments and pleasures of active life can be transferred to the silent chamber of a recluse student but there are others who will not read without emotion the secret thoughts of him who loving literature with its purest passion scarcely repines at being defrauded of his just fame and leaves his stores for the after age of his more gifted heirs thus we open one of oldys's literary days i was informed that day by mr thomas odell's daughter that her father who was deputy inspector and licenser of the plays died twenty four may seventeen forty nine at his house in chapel street westminster aged fifty-eight years he was writing a history of the characters he had observed and conferences he had had with many eminent persons he knew in his time he was a great observator of everything curious in the conversations of his acquaintance and his own conversation was the living chronicle of the remarkable intrigues adventures sayings stories writings etc of many of the quality poets and other authors players booksellers etc who flourished especially in the present century he had been a popular man at elections and some time master of the playhouse in goodman's fields but latterly was forced to live reserved and retired by reason of his debts he published two or three dramatic pieces one was the patron on the story of lord romney q of his day to restore me eustace budgell's papers and to get a sight of her father's have got the one and seen the other july thirty one was at mrs odell's she returned me mr budgell's papers saw some of her husband's papers mostly poems in favour of the ministry and against mr pope one of them printed by the late sir robert walpole's encouragement who gave him ten guineas for writing and as much for the expense of printing it but through his advice it was never published because it might hurt his interest with lord chesterfield and some other noblemen who favoured mr pope for his fine genius the tract i liked best of his writings was the history of his playhouse in goodman's fields 
remember that which was published against that playhouse which i have entered in my london catalogue letter to sir richard brocas lord mayor etc octavo seventeen thirty saw something of the history of his conversations with ingenious men his characters tales jests and intrigues of them of which no man was better furnished with them she thinks she has some papers of these and promises to look them out and also to inquire after mr griffin of the lord chamberlain's office that i may get a search made about spencer so intent was oldest on these literary researches that we see by the last words of this entry how in hunting after one sort of game his undivided zeal kept his eye on another one of his favourite subjects was the realising of original discoveries respecting spenser and shakespeare of whom perhaps to our shame as it is to our vexation it may be said that two of our master poets are those of whom we know the least oldest once flattered himself that he should be able to have given the world a life of shakespeare mr john taylor informs me that oldys had contracted to supply ten years of the life of shakespeare unknown to the biographers with one walker a bookseller in the strand and as oldys did not live to fulfil the engagement my father was obliged to return to walker twenty guineas which he had advanced on the work that interesting narrative is now hopeless for us yet by the solemn contract into which oldys had entered and from his strict integrity it might induce one to suspect that he had made positive discoveries which are now irrecoverable we may observe the manner of his anxious inquiries about spencer ask sir peter thompson if it were improper to try if lord effingham howard would procure the pedigrees in the herald's office to be seen for edmund spencer's parentage or family or how he was related to sir john spencer of althorpe in northamptonshire to three of whose daughters who all married nobility spencer dedicates three of his poems of mr vertu to examine stowe's memorandum book look more carefully for the year when spencer's monument was raised or between which years the entry stands sixteen twenty three and sixteen twenty six sir clement cottrell's book about spencer captain power to know if he has heard from captain spencer about my letter of inquiries relating to edmund spencer of whiston to examine if my remarks on spencer are complete as to the press yes remember when i see mr w thompson to inquire whether he has printed in any of his works any other character of our old poets than those of spencer and shakespeare footnote william thompson the poet of sickness and other poems a warm lover of our elder bards and no vulgar imitator of spencer he was the reviver of bishop hall's satires in seventeen fifty three by an edition which had been more fortunate if conducted by his friend oldys for the text is unfaithful though the edition followed was one borrowed from lord oxford's library probably by the aid of oldys End of footnote and to get the liberty of a visit at kentish town to see his collection of robert green's works in about four large volumes quarto he commonly published a pamphlet every term as his acquaintance tom nash informs us two or three other memorials may excite a smile at his peculiar habits of study and unceasing vigilance to draw from original sources of information dryden's dream at lord exeter's at burley while he was translating virgil as signor verio then painting there related it to the yorkshire painter of whom i had it lies in the parchment book in quarto designed for his life at a subsequent period oldys inserts now entered therein malone quotes this very memorandum which he discovered in oldys's langbane to show dryden had some confidence in oneirocriticism 
and suppose that future events were sometimes prognosticated by dreams malone adds where either the loose prophetic leaf or the parchment book now is i know not unquestionably we have incurred a great loss in oldys's collections for dryden's life which are very extensive such a mass of literary history cannot have perished unless by accident and i suspect that many of oldys's manuscripts are in the possession of individuals who are not acquainted with his handwriting which may be easily verified to search the old papers in one of my large deal boxes for dryden's letters of thanks to my father for some communication relating to plutarch while they and others were publishing a translation of plutarch's lives in five volumes octavo sixteen eighty three it is copied in the yellow book for dryden's life in which there are about one hundred and fifty transcriptions in prose and verse relating to the life character and writings of dryden is england's remembrancer extracted out of my obit obituary into my remarks on him in the poetical bag my extracts in the parchment budget about denham's seat and family in surrey my white vellum pocket-book bordered with gold for the extract from groans of great britain about butler see my account of the great yews in tankersley's park while sir r fanshawe was prisoner in the lodge there especially talbot's yew which a man on horseback might turn about in in my botanical budget this donald lupton i have mentioned in my catalogue of all the books and pamphlets relative to london in folio begun anno seventeen forty and in which i have now seventeen forty entered between three hundred and four hundred articles besides remarks etc now in june seventeen forty eight between four hundred and five hundred articles now in october seventeen fifty six hundred and thirty six footnote this is one of oldys's manuscripts a thick folio of titles which has been made to do its duty with small thanks from those who did not care to praise the service which they derived from it it passed from dr barkenhout to george stevens who lent it to gough it was sold for five guineas the useful work of ten years of attention given to it the antiquary gough alludes to it with his usual discernment among these titles of books and pamphlets about london are many purely historical and many of too low a kind to rank under the head of topography and history thus the design of oldys in forming this elaborate collection is condemned by trying it by the limited object of the topographer's view this catalogue remains a desideratum were it printed entire as collected by oldys not merely for the topography of the metropolis but for its relation to its manners domestic annals events and persons connected with its history end of section sixty two end of curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli